Did you know that Quentin Tarantino has considered making a sequel to Reservoir Dogs 30 years in the making? When did he write a number one New York Times bestseller? And did a cameo as Elvis on The Golden Girls really fund his first movie? Do you know everything about Quentin Tarantino or are you a square? Find out right here. Though Quentin Tarantino might sound like a stage name, his birth name was indeed Quentin Jerome Tarantino. His mother named him after a Burt Reynolds character, Quint Asper, from Gunsmoke. He inherited his last name from his dad, Tony Tarantino, but grew up using the last name Zostapil after his stepfather. In a 2021 appearance on the WTF podcast with Mark Marin, Tarantino admitted that if he were starting his career today, he'd probably use his middle name, making Once Upon a Time in Hollywood a film from visionary director Quentin Jerome. Tarantino explained to Mark Marin, I didn't even know about the name Tarantino really at that time. Zastapil was my name. I was always known by that. Although his mother had remarried musician Curtis Zastapil, when Quentin got into his late teens, he began to feel like his biological father's name just sounded better. It sounded cool. Quentin it was Tar Italian. Yeah, yeah. It sounded Quentin Tarantino. sounded like a cool name. It had nothing to do with him. It had nothing to do with the family. Quentin Tarantino was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, but he mostly grew up in California. His mother met his father when she came to Los Angeles in the early 60s on a trip. She was briefly married to the law student and aspiring entertainer, but after their divorce, moved back to Knoxville to be with her parents. Tarantino and his mom both returned to LA, however, when he was about three years old. In a 2010 interview with the UK Telegraph, Tarantino had this to say about his birth father. I never knew my father. He wanted to be an actor. Now he's an actor only because of my last name. But he was never part of my life. I didn't know him. I've never met him. Born in Queens and raised in Brooklyn, Tony Tarantino became an actor because of his father Dominic, who appeared in westerns in the 1930s. According to IMDb, Tony has acted in 10 projects and produced two films. Quentin and Tony's estrangement has occasionally made headlines, as in 2015 when the two publicly disagreed over matters of police brutality. Tarantino has also had a difficult relationship with his mother at times. In a 2021 interview with The Moment podcast, the director said he's been hesitant to assist his mom financially because of memories from when he was young and trying to write early scripts. I spend a lot of time writing my scripts. And then when I'm done, now I gotta go make the movie. Some of these early scripts would eventually go on to form the basis of films like Reservoir Dogs, True Romance, and Natural Born Killers. The problem, it seems, is that he was working on these scripts during school time. Tarantino said on the podcast, in the middle of her little tirade, she said, oh, and by the way, this little writing career, with the finger quotes, this little writing career that you're doing, that is over. She just meant don't do it in class when you're supposed to be doing something else. All these decades later, Tarantino still remembers the exchange, recalling, when she said that to me in that sarcastic way, I was in my head and I go, okay, lady, when I become a successful writer, you will never see one penny from my success. There will be no house for you. There's no vacation for you. You get nothing because you said that. Ultimately, he said he has stuck to that resolution, revealing, I helped her out of a jam with the IRS, but no house, no Cadillac. Anybody who knows anything about Quentin Tarantino knows the backstory. In the 80s, he was among the resident geeks at the now legendary video archive store in Manhattan Beach. And aside from writing my scripts that no one ever read, uh, you know, my only form of artistic expression was managing this video store. In perhaps one of his most famous quotes, Tarantino told the BBC in 2004, when people ask me if I went to film school, I tell them no, I went to films. It was at video archives where Tarantino would hold court behind the counter and watch so many of those films. Tarantino told NBC News in 2004, I was just looking for a minimum wage job. I could have worked at video archives, I could have worked at Pioneer Chicken, but luckily I got in at video archives and it was real fun. Tarantino had spent much of his life going to movies, and by the time he was applying at Video Archives, he was already a walking encyclopedia of film history. The director told NBC News, I got the job because I was a movie expert. When you clear out everything in your life and focus on one thing, you better know a lot about it. Until I became a director, it was the best job I'd ever had. As streaming services have increasingly influenced the film industry, directors like Christopher Nolan and Steven Spielberg have made their opinions known on the perceived threat to cinema. Nobody loves film more than Tarantino. And since he's never been known for being shy, the Reservoir Dogs director has made his opinion on the matter known. Commenting on the rise of streaming services, Tarantino had this to say in a 2015 IndieWire interview. 
I am not excited about streaming at all. I like something hard and tangible in my hand, and I can't watch a movie on a laptop. I don't use Netflix at all. I don't have any sort of delivery system. In a 2017 interview with The Playlist, Tarantino talked about how going to a video store was more of an investment and a more communal experience, admitting, there was a different quality to the video store. You looked around, you picked up boxes, you read the back of the boxes, you made a choice, and maybe you talked to the guy behind the counter, and maybe he pointed you towards something. These days, video stores are largely gone, and Tarantino's movies have made their way to streaming services. Perhaps he has even warmed to the possibilities of streaming. In 2019, Tarantino worked with Netflix on a much-hyped longer cut of The Hateful Eight. Keep in mind, this was shortly after he had toured the movie on 70mm film, pretty much as old-school as you can get and perhaps proof that celluloid and streaming can indeed coexist. Tarantino told Slash Film, Netflix came to us and said, hey, look, if you'd be interested in putting it together and in a way that we could show it as three or four episodes, we'd be willing to do that. I thought, wow, that's really intriguing. I was game to give that a shot. Though Tarantino says he's been to jail, there have been questions surrounding these claims over the years, and even accusations that such stories are an attempt to make himself seem like a tough guy. Tarantino told the movie-themed TV What the Flick in 2015. I was in jail three different times. The last time was for eight days. Three days, one time, two days, another time, and then eight days the last time. The New York Post published an article labeling his story a lie, claiming there's no record of his time served at a Los Angeles County jail. Tarantino fired back, saying, They're just really bad journalists. It would be so easy for them to look it up, but they're actually not doing the work that it takes to look it up. Tarantino is also fond of telling a story about childhood shoplifting that has since gone on to become part of his legend. When he was 15, he stole a copy of the Elmore Leonard crime paperback The Switch from a Kmart in Torrance, California. After being arrested and released by the police, he was grounded for the summer by his mother. Once he had served his time, he went back and stole the book, this time successfully. Tarantino claims he still has the book, and about 20 years later, its Leonard-penned quasi-sequel Rum Punch would help serve as source material for one of his most beloved films, Jackie Brown. Love him or hate him, there's no debate, Tarantino's movies are often violent, unrelenting depictions of murder, mayhem, and dismemberment. From the cop's ear in Reservoir Dogs to the bride's blood-spraying Kill Bill showdown with the Crazy 88, the man is responsible for more severed body parts than your average neighborhood carnival ride. In real life, he has been asked about violence for decades, and has at times become angered by the constant implications that it is hypocritical to put such violence in his movies for fun, yet condemn it in the real world. Well, I just reject your hypotheses. Tarantino told The Observer in 1994, to say that I get a big kick out of violence in movies and can enjoy violence in movies, but find it totally abhorrent in real life, I can feel totally justified and totally comfortable with that statement. Real life violence is real life violence. Movies are movies. While doing publicity in 2013 for Django Unchained, arguably his most violent film, Tarantino went viral with a confrontational interview with a British journalist. The director shot back when the UK Channel 4 interview tried to press him on the issue of violence in his movies. And I'm shutting your butt down. Explaining repeatedly that he'd already answered questions about that topic multiple times in the past, Tarantino went on to add, I refuse your question. I'm not your slave and you're not my master. You I'm, can't make me dance to your tune. I, I I'm, not, I'm not a monkey. Tarantino has been involved in many classic films, and not just the ones he's directed, but also some he has had a hand in writing or acting in. Although an exact timeline is hard to nail down, True Romance was the first script for a major motion picture he sold, Natural Born Killers was a movie he wrote for himself but didn't yet have the clout to direct, and From Dusk Till Dawn was his first paid writing gig. In a 2009 interview with BackwoodsHorror.com, special effects legend Robert Kurtzman, who is credited for coming up with the story of From Dusk Till Dawn, remembered how Tarantino came onto the project, saying, I conceived the project and wrote a treatment that outlined the film and the characters. Producer David Goodman had told me about a young writer who he thought would be perfect to write Dusk. He hooked us up and QT and I soon got together to discuss collaborating. Kurtzman said that he and his producers didn't have a lot of money to pay Tarantino, but it was enough cash for the then aspiring filmmaker to leave his job to write the script for From Dusk Till Dawn full time. Kurtzman told the website, it was actually Tarantino's first work for hire screenplay. We made a deal. QT would write our script and I would do the special effects for Reservoir. 
We spent the next 10 years trying to set the film up. It was initially rejected everywhere, even after the success of Reservoir and Pulp. By the mid-90s, however, the heat had become too hot around Tarantino and El Mariachi filmmaker Robert Rodriguez to ignore, so Dusk finally got the green light. The film starred Harvey Keitel, Juliette Lewis, Selma Hayek, and some guy named George Clooney who was trying to make the jump from television to movies. Now, do we all agree that what we are dealing with is vampires? Tarantino would turn in arguably the most substantial acting performance he's ever given, as the lewd brother to Clooney's character. Kurtzman added, When Rodriguez became interested, it was a no-brainer. Once Rodriguez boarded the picture, it went from what was conceived as a small $1.5 million movie to a $17 million film with top-name talent. The rest is history. Reportedly, Tarantino received a mere $1,500 to write the script. Tarantino's Oscar juggernaut Once Upon a Time in Hollywood made just under $400 million worldwide at the box office, making it the second highest grossing film of his career. But it ranks alone in his filmography when it comes to book sales? The novelization of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood marked the writer-slash-director's debut as an author, arriving at number one on the New York Times fiction bestseller list. If you've seen the film, you know that it exists in an extremely detailed alternate reality where fictional characters live, mingle, and co-star with very real legends like Bruce Lee. Tarantino used his novelization to not only recount the story in prose, but to dive even deeper into his characters' backstories. Readers learn, for instance, that Rick killed more Japanese soldiers in World War II than anyone in U.S. military history, and that Cliff did indeed kill his wife. Speaking about the book on an episode of the Pure Cinema podcast, Tarantino had this to say. I'm really happy with it. I'm really proud of it. If you're a fan of the movie, I think you will get a kick out of reading the book and exploring the characters further. It's not just me taking the screenplay and then breaking it down in a novelistic form. I retold the story as a novel. If you're a fan of Tarantino's writing, you'll be happy to learn that a new book involving DiCaprio's character Dalton is also on the way. Although the 1992 crime classic Reservoir Dogs is technically Tarantino's first feature-length film, it was not his first attempt at getting a filmmaking career off the ground. In 1983, he collaborated with friend Scott McGill on Love Birds in Bondage, a film he intended to star in, co-write, and co-direct. Whatever footage was shot of that film was eventually destroyed. A few years later, Tarantino got closer with My Best Friend's Birthday. That film told the story of a man named Mickey whose girlfriend recently left him. Tarantino played Clarence, who was trying to make his friend feel better via a surprise. Years later, Tarantino would call the comedy a Martin and Lewis kind of thing, and shot the film while working at video archives alongside Roger Avery, who served as a cinematographer. Seven years later, these indie film geeks would be standing on stage at the Oscars sharing a Best Original Screenplay trophy for Pulp Fiction. By the time Pulp Fiction comes out, I'm actually a no at least among the critics, yeah. I'm a known entity. History apparently repeated itself, and the legend goes that much of Friend's birthday was lost in a fire, although Tarantino has since said that the fire story isn't true. Either way, only 36 minutes of the film remain, and it is in a barely watchable black and white and fuzzy format, but if you're curious, you can view the footage online. With dark rants about how the Partridge family saved his character from suicide, you can see the early seeds of Tarantino's genius. Writers, actors, directors, producers, and everyone in between are expected to flesh out hit after hit. Tarantino, as an example, is expected to make a movie that's not only met with critical acclaim, but one that also reaches glory at the box office. Achieving all these feats takes a myriad of things to go right, all starting with a well-written script. I was BAM! I was seen as a writer-director from the very beginning. As for the 2009 war film Inglorious Bastards, Tarantino worked on it for nearly a decade. Tarantino wrote Kill Bill Volume 1 in between writing Inglorious Bastards and at one point was considering names like Adam Sandler and Michael Madsen for roles. The extra time he took with this script paid off, as Bastards was nominated for eight Oscars, racked up over $300 million worldwide at the box office, and brought Tarantino's career roaring back to prominence. Although a decade might seem like a long time to work on a script, Tarantino's patience and willingness to get it right paid off in spades. That's a bingo! <laughs> Is that the way you say it? That's a bingo. You just say bingo. In 1988, a young Tarantino still struggling to gain traction in Hollywood as a writer, director, or actor appeared on an episode of the hit sitcom The Golden Girls. He was one of many Elvis impersonators in Sophia's Wedding Part 1, and believe it or not, Dorothy, Rose, Sophia, and Blanche helped finance Reservoir Dogs, albeit in an extremely indirect way. In a 2020 appearance on The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon, Tarantino revealed that he made about $3,000 in residuals from his appearance on the two-part episode. The director added, 
And that kept me going during our post a pre production time trying to get Reservoir Dogs going. So thank Golden Girls for Reservoir Dogs. As any Tarantino diehard knows, he is an Elvis admirer. In True Romance, Christian Slater's character Clarence gets regular visits from a Jiminy Cricket like Elvis, played by Val Kilmer. Additionally, Pulp Fiction has a deleted scene where Mia Wallace explains that the world is filled with two types of people Elvis people and Beatles people. Now, Beatles people can like Elvis, and Elvis people can like Beatles, but nobody likes them both equally. In a 2019 interview with Uncut, Tarantino reiterated his love for the king, telling the outlet, When I was young, I used to think Elvis was the voice of truth. I don't know what that means, but his voice, man, it sounded so f pure. The hillbilly cat never let you down. Tarantino might be viewed as a filmmaker above all else, but he actually has more acting credits than directing ones. As of May 2022, Tarantino has 21 director credits to his name, yet his 38 acting credits surpass that. He also has 22 producer credits and 30 writing credits, as well as a whopping 252 self-credits. Tarantino, by all measures, has left his mark on Hollywood, from behind and in front of the camera. If you're looking for some off-the-beaten-path Tarantino acting, you can look beyond the obvious cameos in Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, and Django Unchained, and take a peek at the fun episode of All-American Girl he did in 1995, spoofing Pulp Fiction alongside then-girlfriend Margaret Cho. A couple years later, he would appear in Spike Lee's Girl 6 as a thinly-veiled version of himself, and his off-the-wall appearance as a blind preacher in Adam Sandler's Little Nicky has to be seen to be believed. It's rare to find creators who don't like their own characters, but there are certainly exceptions, especially when those characters are just plain horrible. To say Tarantino doesn't fancy the Calvin Candy character played by Leonardo DiCaprio in Django Unchained is an understatement. In a 2012 interview with Playboy magazine, the director had this to say about his cinematic creation. I hated Candy, and I normally like my villains no matter how bad they are. I could see his point of view, but I hated it so much. For the first time as a writer, I just hated this guy. Going along with that sentiment, DiCaprio also appears to find the character despicable. The Oscar-winning actor told EW in 2012, He was one of the most deplorable, indulgent, horrendous characters I've ever read in my life. This man's code of ethics was so beyond or below anything that I could ever imagine, but it was a delicious character nonetheless. Product placement is an unfortunate necessity in almost any modern movie, but from the very beginnings of his career, Tarantino has sidestepped brand names whenever possible to instead use hyper-real Tarantino Universe brands, such as the Hawaiian fast food restaurant Big Kahuna Burger and Red Apple Cigarettes. Give me back a Red Apples. Fill this. Yeah. Fans could reasonably expect that Tarantino must hate product placement, but the opposite is apparently true. According to the auteur, it's the real-life brands who typically don't want to be featured in his films. While being interviewed in the 2011 film The Greatest Movie Ever Sold, Tarantino said, I haven't done that much product placement in my movies because for the most part I've actually been usually refused. All of my first scripts had some scenes that took place at a Denny's. In both cases, Denny's goes no. When you have a long-standing career like Quentin Tarantino and such a distinctive brand, Hollywood will come knocking regularly. Coupled with Tarantino's methods of beginning projects, then moving elsewhere if he loses interest, there's a long list of woulda, coulda movies that QT's fans will most likely never see. Tarantino films that never came to fruition include Double V Vega, perhaps the most tantalizing, unproduced project, which would have brought together the similarly surnamed characters of Vic Vega, played by Michael Madsen in Reservoir Dogs, and Vincent Vega, played by John Travolta in Pulp Fiction. Even though both died in their respective movies, Tarantino told The Real Blend podcast in 2019, It would have taken place in Amsterdam, so it would have taken place in the time that Vincent was in Amsterdam. At some point, Vic shows up to visit him, and it would have been their weekend. Exactly what happens to them or what trouble they get into, I never took it that far. Depending on who you believe, Tarantino has also either pitched or been pitched attempts to mix his unique flavor with Star Trek, James Bond, Russ Meyer, and even the Marvel superhero Luke Cage long before the MCU was a thing. As for his own films, a persistent rumor continues that he could do a third chapter of Kill Bill. In a 2021 appearance on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast, Tarantino explained that the story would have the daughter of Vivica A. Fox's character out for vengeance. The movie would also reportedly cast Uma Thurman's real-life daughter, Maya Hawke, as the offspring of Beatrix Kiddo. The director went on to add, I think it's just revisiting the characters 20 years later and just imagining the bride and her daughter, Bibi, having 20 years of peace and then that peace is shattered, and now the bride and Bibi are on the run. Tarantino has even thought about revisiting one of his own classics. 
In a 2021 appearance on Real Time with Bill Maher, the director told the host, I actually have considered about doing a remake of Reservoir Dogs as my last movie. I won't do it, Internet, all right? But I, I, I considered it. <laughs> If any of those projects are going to come to fruition, Tarantino better hurry up and choose carefully, because he has been going on record for years, claiming that after 10 films, he will walk away. This is a position he has reiterated even after the massive success of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which would count as film number nine by his estimation. QT seems determined to go out on top and is well aware of brilliant filmmakers whose final efforts diminished their canon. You're at the top of your game. Why? That's why I want to quit! Asked if he was serious, the then 58-year-old filmmaker made his case, telling Bill Maher, I've given it everything I have. Every s single solitary You're thing I have. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite celebs are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.